want to talk about um, purposes for uh, praying, praying in tongues. And we've already established from our teaching that um, speaking in other tongues is the initial evidence. But really not the only, just not just the initial evidence, it should be the ongoing evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which leads us into purposes of praying in tongues. So let's go over, if we will, to the uh, first book of Corinthians and run over to chapter 14. First Corinthians 14. And let's look in, um, now you understand chapters 12, 13, and 14 is a continuing theme. We're talking about uh, spiritual gifts and settings and, and, and diversities of things in the body in 12, 13, really not another chapter. Continu it is a continuation of thought in the that fact that love is what tempers the gifts or provides the foundation of the motivation behind functioning in, in spiritual gifts so that we don't become, like, like he says in um, chapter 13, verse 1, if I have not love, I become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Um, so we understand that, that love is stuck in between the chapters of 12 and 14. Uh, 13 is in there because it's the tempering of power and of manifestations. And so all manifestations of the Spirit, everything about the Holy Spirit, and, and we even saw it in, in the charismatic renewal and in, in, in uh, neo-Pentecostalism, um, how that um, the power became more important than, than the motive. And so we have to make sure we temper the things of God by love, by the love of God. And so that we, our, our attitude and everything is, is not in your face or I, I'm better than you are, or I got more than you got, but we're, it's, it, the, the gifts and the, and the ministries of the Spirit are for that very thing, ministry, and to help people, not for us to talk about what we've got, okay? And so love was a tempering. So he, he picks up at 14, uh, verse 1, and says, follow after love. The word charity is agape in the Greek. So he says, <clears throat> um, follow after charity, or follow after agape, follow after the love of God, and desire spiritual gifts. Now, um, again, this, this particular term is used in chapter 12, verse 1 also, now concerning spiritual gifts. The word gifts is, in a, is italicized, it's not in the Greek. Um, the word really is plural, and it, it's spirituals. Now, now, follow after love and desire spirituals. And literally, um, you could say it kind of this way, uh, follow after love and desire things of and pertaining to the Holy Ghost. Spiritual things. Okay? Spiritual things. Not just gifts, but spiritual things. Desire. Spirit. We, we should be desirous of walking in the Spirit and functioning in spiritual things. Amen? Not only the gifts of the Spirit, but in the leading of the Spirit and the wisdom of the Spirit. Uh, we, sh those, we should be desirous of spiritual things. Um, I believe Colossians says, set your affections on things above and not on the earth. Amen. Well, what's above it? Spiritual things. Okay, we, we should be spiritual people. Now, spiritual, spirituality is not that you prophesied last week. Not that you gave a tongue and interpretation. Not that you laid hands on somebody and they got healed. That's not spirituality. Spirituality is walking in accordance with the leading of the Holy Ghost and walking in that realm in a consistent basis. Hallelujah. So we walk, follow after love and desire spiritual things, things that pertaining to the Holy Ghost, but rather that you may prophesy. Now, let me, before we get really into this chapter, because we're going to get into, you know, something here in just a second, um, understand that the book, the books or the letters, really the letters, uh, to the church at Corinth, Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 2, and we believe that there's internal evidence from the letters that there was probably a, a, th a third and a fourth letter. 
um, that actually that this may have been is, is either the second or the third letter to the church of Corinth and then there's one, in, one before and one after or a couple of them but we know that the fourth one was probably the fourth the second was probably the fourth letter um, just from some internal evidences in the letters there's things that Paul says that lead us to believe that uh, there's, there's maybe as many as four letters to that church because there was a lot of correction they needed they needed not not in a, in a sense of you're just, you know, you're horrible people. But they were carnal. They were just flat out carnal, <laughs> you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and they disused the gifts. You know, they, they, were, they, they were carnal because of, really because of the immaturity. Okay. And so Paul had to do a lot of, a lot of straightening up. And uh, so understand that when certain things are said, because you under, if you understand why it's written, and it's written as a corrective letter, then you can understand why was th certain things are said and not over emphasize what was said um, altogether. In other words, it, it, has, it has bearing and it has weight, but it was for correction, not for um, saying these things are completely wrong. So he says here, um, and, and the reason I said that is because, you know, they, they, would, uh, they would speak in tongues to, to a fault almost. In other words, they would, they would just get together and start speaking in tongues and they'd never say, get anything in, in their language and nothing got done. Well, can you imagine if we had a board meeting or, or a staff meeting here at the church and we all came in there and just spoke in tongues and walked out, woo, I got blessed. We didn't get a thing done. There was no profit to what we were meeting for. Oh, yeah, if you pray in tongues, everybody had the wisdom of God and the law. No, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't get weird. We all know what we're supposed to do. Then why don't we just everybody do it? Because it doesn't work that way. There are, there, you know, uh, Paul wouldn't have needed to written these letters if, if praying in tongues enough because that church at Corinth would have gotten all figured out by praying in tongues. Okay? He would, he would say, you guys just keep praying in tongues. You'll figure it out. That's not what he said, is it? There was correction brought, okay? All right. He that speaketh, in, now the word unknown again here is not in the Greek either because it's unknown, it's italicized. So let's say he speaketh in a tongue, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For uh, no man understandeth him, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. And then verse 3 goes on and says, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in the unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Okay. So we're seeing, um, we're seeing differences in purpose, don't we? Prophecies for the purpose of edifying the church. Tongues are the purpose of edifying the man. Uh, the individual. That's not a negative statement. That is a clarification statement. It's not a statement that we don't need tongues. You know, oh, Paul said in verse 14, uh, um, what is it? Uh, where is it? 19, I, in the church I'd rather speak five words by understanding than 10,000 words in a tongue. Huh? That, Paul said tongues weren't worth anything. Except the verse before that, he said, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than y'all. Amen. If somebody wouldn't mind, if we can um, reduce the heating element in here, would be nice. All right. So he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men. All right. That means we're not speaking to men when we pray in tongues. Or even when they get the get manifestation of tongues for the purpose of interpretation is in manifestation. Without the interpretation, we're not speaking to men. Remember, greater is he that prophesies, lest he interpret, than he that speaketh in a tongue, lest he interpret. Okay? So then tongues and interpretation tongues are equal to prophecy in public worship or public services where, or, or in, 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 in ministry. Um, but here he says, let's, let's, we're going to look at the first purpose. He says, he that speaketh in a tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Somebody could come on and say, well, I, didn't, you know, I, don't, I don't even know what you're doing over there. I don't get, didn't get a thing out of what you're doing. I'm not speaking to you. I'm not talking to you. Amen. But unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it. Listen to this term. He, Paul says this, that speaking in tongues is this. How be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Speaking in tongues is speaking in the spirit. 
desire spiritual gifts or spirituals, things of and pertaining to the Holy Ghost. Amen? He, uh, follow after love and desire things of and pertaining to the Holy Ghost. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth how be it in the Spirit. In the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the Spirit. Glory to God. Can we shut those doors? Hallelujah. In the Spirit. Now listen. In the Spirit, he speaks what? Mysteries. Hallelujah. Paul says here that the prayer in tongues is speaking mysteries. Why are they mysteries? Because he is in divine connection and communication with God. Let's put, it's kind of, we could probably, probably if this was written today, he could even use uh, computer um, jargon for modems and stuff. You know, how be it in the spirit, he speaks with um, um, encrypted language. Okay? He's speaking encrypted language with God. Okay? This only, and, and when you have something that's encrypted, only the sending in and the receiving in know what's going on. Okay? So if you're, if you're speaking in, in the Spirit, if you're speaking in encrypted language with God, God understands what you're saying. And let me say this. Your Spirit understands what you're saying. In your mind. Now, what is Paul, let's, let's jump over here. Down in... Um, <clears throat> verse 14, if I pray in the unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my, listen to this, he didn't say your spirit, but my understanding's unfruitful. My understanding's unfruitful. Isn't that what he says? He says, so we, fi we find out here that when we pray in an unknown tongue, our spirit, or our tongue, it's unknown, the unknown was put in there because it, they thought it helped them understand. It's unknown to what we're saying. You, know, you, you might be speaking language, you have no clue what it is. You might not know what you're speaking. In most cases, you don't. You might be able to pick and say, well, that sounds like such and such. You know, and, and of course, the Bible says, though I speak with the tongues of men or angels, you know, their heaven, their, their, their languages, we may be speaking in an earthly known language. We might be speaking in a heavenly unknown language. But to us, it's unknown. Okay? In other words, you don't speak that language. Hallelujah. But Paul said, when I speak in a tongue, my, what? Spirit. My spirit prayeth. It's coming out of your human spirit that's been baptized with the Holy Ghost. And, and he says this, but my understanding is unfruitful. So we know this much, that praying in an unknown tongue comes out of your spirit, but your mind's not engaged with that. That's why I said your spirit understands what you're saying. Now, you may not cognitively be able to perceive exactly what it is, but your spirit is communing with God. Spirit to spirit. Hallelujah. Communing with the Father of spirits. And he knows exactly what you're saying. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? So, praying in, in tongues is divine communication with the Father. Amen. The Amplified says, my spirit, by the Holy Spirit within me prayeth. You're being unctioned by the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. So, when we pray in another tongue, we enter into a place, and this, this I'll tell you one reason that Satan has fought this as much or more than anything else in the church, is he doesn't know what you're saying. He is left out outside. See, so if you go in there and say, no, Lord, I'm believing God for $10,000 to do such and such and such and such, and I'm believing for this, and I'm, he knows everything, exactly what you're saying. He, he, now listen, this is not to put you out of faith, but he knows what you're saying. Do you think he's just going to stand by and not go work on doing something about it? Hello? No, he's going he's gonna to charge demon spirits. Go make sure that don't happen. Go make sure that don't happen. Go make sure that don't happen. Now, faith will stop that. I understand that. I, I'm, I'm not saying that gets you in fear. But when you get to praying in the Spirit, he don't know what you're saying. Yeah. He, can't, he can't commission anything against what you're praying. He don't have a clue what you're saying. Because it's, 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 it's encrypted. Hallelujah. It's encrypted in the Spirit, and he, doesn't, and he can't hack it. Hello. 
Are you here? I mean, God's got the best firewall in the world. <laughs> Hallelujah. In the universe. That language is coming in. It, he can't be, he can't get it. He, he, Satan can't get involved in it. So when you're, that's why a lot of times when you're praying things out and you're working on the front end, you're praying in the spirit, you're communing with God and God's communing with your spirit and revelation becomes to your spirit and so forth. And, um, and, and when that divine communication is going on, Satan's left outside. Well, as that's taking place, what, you know, we, when we kind of get into the second one here without really, you know, running off too far on it, verse 4 says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth, charges himself, builds himself up, comes from the uh, Greek uh, oikodomio. Yeah, okay, and I don't know how that's that said. To build a house, to erect a building, to build, to restore, to repair, to build, to establish. In other words, and, and, and one person said in modern English, you could say it this way, to charge like a battery. You edify yourself. Think of the frustration it is to the devil that you're communing with God, you're getting built up, and he don't have a clue what you're saying. Hello. So what does he do? The only combat he has to it is to try to stop people from praying in tongues. Yeah. So, it's of the devil. Well, then that's, 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 that's original. I, I inspired that, folks. That's what the devil said. I inspired that. Why? Yet Paul said, Paul said, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. And we're to desire spiritual things. In verse, in, in the 14th verse, he said that when you speak in an unknown tongue, your spirit prayeth. Amen. Isn't that what he says? But his understanding is unfruitful. We, well, if your understanding is unfruitful, you know your head don't, you can't understand what you're saying. If you understand what you're, and it actually makes it even clearer in verse 15, what is it then I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding. Also, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Amen? Now, understand, a lot of what he's saying here about when, and not, when to and when not to do things is in reference to public assembly. Because he comes in the next verse, says, Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen? In that giving of thanks, seeing thou understandest thou not what thou sayest, for thou verily givest thanks. Listen to this. Yeah. Thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Oh. So he's saying praying in the Spirit and singing in the Spirit is giving thanks well. Isn't that what he said? So we, <clears throat> people who are against something major on aspects of it and ampl amplify them out of their place. I thank my God, you know, that the other's not, all oh, the other person's not edified. Yeah, but you're giving thanks well. Yeah. I thank my God I speak in tongues more than y'all. Yet in the church, talking in reference to public assembly. See, he's bringing correction about public assembly. He's not trying to stop people from praying in tongues. As a matter of fact, when you read this, he says when you pray in tongues, you give thanks well. He says when you pray in tongues, you're communing with God in the encrypted language. That's my, that's my new coin language for the day. You know, he, he speaks of divine, he speaks of mysteries or divine secrets. It's encrypted. He says in verse 14 that, you know, um, when you pray in the unknown tongue, your spirit pray, it's your, your, your spiritual prayer. It's prayer out of your spirit. So speaking in tongues is praying with your spirit. Speaking in tongues is, is encrypted or divine communication with God. Speaking in tongues, you get thanks well. Amen? But somebody wants to come along here and take verse 19. Yet in the church I'd rather speak five. Paul said I'd rather speak five words by understanding the 10,000 words in tongues. That's not what he said. He said in the church. He is in reference to, in, in, in any, anybody, if they're honest, any preacher who's honest, because they teach you this in school. They teach you this in Bible school. You, you find out who the letter's written to, why the letter is written. Yeah. That's part of the proper um, exegesis of the scriptures. Yeah. That, that is just this basic, that's basic exegesis 101. Right. Who, why, and where? I mean, who, why, where, and what? Those are, those are very important questions as you start reading a, script, a, a book or a letter in the Bible. Because you, that gives you, um, that gives you the, <laughs> not the parameters, that gives you the setting in which that letter is intended. 
okay? If you take it out of that and don't have that, then you can, you can make it say things it doesn't say. But this, this was written in a setting as a corrective letter. And you go back to the very beginning. I mean, um, <laughs> it's pretty interesting what Paul says in the first part of this book. And I, I, since I've said that, I better go ahead and, and, and say this. Um, Where is it? Oh my, I should have, I, I wasn't going to say it. He says, he talks, starts talking to him and says, you come behind and no gift, you got to have someone against you. And he, he goes on and blasts them. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. I mean, he, he, he lays them out. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, glory to God. Amen. He, they just kind of, he talk, calls them carnal and calls them all kinds of things. And then, but yeah, they, they don't come behind any gift. <laughs> there's, there's no gift they come behind in. There you go. A verse, uh, how, did I, how did I miss that? I looked right down there at it. I just missed it. Chapter 1, verse 7. So, you know, uh, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirming you, so that you come behind and no gift. <laughs> Boy, they don't come behind any gift. They're operating them wide open. Yeah, yeah. Amen? And then he goes on, and they get lamb blasted the rest of the letter. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because, because they, need, they need correction and parameters to how they function. So when you understand, here Paul in this, this chapter has already given us uh, three insights into speaking in tongues that, that most people don't even, don't even acknowledge. One is that when you pray in tongues, your, your spirit is praying. Two, you're in divine communication with God. Yeah, no man understands you, but you're in divine communication with God. That was not, that's not a negative thing. How be it in the spirit? He speaks mysteries. That is not negative. Amen. He speaketh in unknown tongue, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. So really you could throw in there, not only is it divine communication, but you're speaking to God. When you pray in tongues, you're speaking to God. And you're speaking to God in encrypted language or divine secrets or divine mysteries. That it is your spirit that is praying. And then you're giving thanks well. Hallelujah. That yet in the church is very important to that statement. I'd rather speak five words of my understanding than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. That by my voice I might teach others. Amen. But then he goes right behind that and says, Be not children in understanding. How be it in malice be you children, but in understanding be men. I think there's people who deliberately just pull that part out, leave out yet in the church, and run off and build doctrines against speaking in tongues or being dishonest. They're being scripturally dishonest. Their exegesis of the scriptures is dishonest. Okay? Hallelujah. Because he, you know, he even goes on here in verse 21, says, And the law it is written with men of other tongues and lips while I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me. Wherefore tongues? It's that other tongues, that, where he says here in verse 21, he verse, somebody asked me one time a number of years ago, uh, we quoted that scripture with other tongue, men of other tongues and, and, and lips, with stammering this in another tongue, I'll speak unto this people. And that is the quote that is, is quoted here in verse 20. Um, and it's found back, let's see here, it's found back in Isaiah 28, 11, and 12. With stammering lips and another tongue, will I speak to this people? Okay. Well, he quotes that here. They say, well, I, don't, I just can't see how, speaking with tongue, how that relates to speaking in tongues. And, um, but if you read this with 20 and 21, you find out he said, quote, he, he refers to that scripture, 20, Isaiah 28. And then in 21, I mean, in 22, he says, wherefore tongues? So he clarifies that with stammering lips and another tongue, while I speak to this people, is speaking in tongues. Yes. Amen. Okay? So we, we have to understand, and, and there's a lot of other things Paul says in this chapter. When we come together, this, that, this stuff, stuff, da 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 da. But I'm after the points here of why we pray in tongues or speak in tongues, okay, as a believer. Well, if you're communing with God and Satan can't understand you, isn't that just wonderful? <laughs> Think about it. Have you ever wanted to communicate with somebody, but you want to make sure that nobody can understand it? What do you do? You get them off in the corner and you tell secrets. Now, 
if you ever want to do that on the phone, you know, well, your people can be listening, you know, people can steal your email if you're in your office. If you do an email from your office, you know, uh, there's all kinds of problems. Now you've got situations you get out of your office and go on the log me in or something and, and tap into another computer and they can't see what you're doing because it, it can't register that on the local server because you're out there, on the, out there somewhere else doing it. It's just showing up on your screen. But what actually took place isn't recorded there. Am I correct? Yeah, okay. Just making sure I was double correct. Yeah, like if I log into the church from another computer somewhere and I'm running it on log me in, what actually is going on on the screen there is not happening on that computer. It's happening on the computer I'm running. And, it, you know, so that's, that is a encrypted or whatever. So even if they had, uh, if they were trying to find out where I visited or whatever, all I could see is I went to log me in. They wouldn't be able to see what I did. And so when you get to pray in tongues, all Satan knows is you're communicating with God. And he starts beating his head against the wall because he wants to know what you're saying. Because he wants to know if you're about to make a turn, if you're about to get a hold of something, if faith is about to rise in your heart, if you, I mean, you know what, all kinds of things he's got on his mind. Because he wants to stop you. So, um, when we get into these places, and as, as we pray consistently, something that you know, Pastor Darrell was talking about praying in tongues, um, he, he, he gave, he told me, he gave a pastor one time some advice. He said, if you'll spend one, one hour every day praying in tongues, it'll change your preaching, it'll change everything. Amen. Amen. If you'll pray an hour and day in tongues, it'll change your life. Amen. You know, you can do it in, in half hour blocks. You can do it in 15 minute blocks, four, four 15 minute sessions a day. I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure you find time to watch down with the television somewhere. Especially if it's Oprah or something with Dr. Phil, you just may as well turn that off and go pray in tongues. Now, I can guarantee you nothing that either one of them are going to say is going to help you. Amen? <clears throat> and you know I'm talking right. <laughs> I mean, you got people like Dr. Phil giving advice. He can't even keep his own self straight. And we'll just leave that alone. Hallelujah. So, divine communication. And then he says over here in... Um, the fourth verse, he that speaketh an unknown tongue edify him, edifies himself. Can I, can I say that we need to be charged up all the time? We all need to be charged up all the time. You need to pray and get charged up, glory to God. Coming, you know, and not coming to church drugged down, wore out, meet up against the wall, barely, can't hardly get yourself in the door. I mean, you know, charged up ready to go, energized, through what? Through praying in the Spirit. Amen. One of the things, you know, he, he talked about how the charismatic renewal is, 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 is dead. It is. I mean, you know, you, you, know, you, you went into the churches, and, and, and you understand what the charismatic renewal was. It was going into liturgical, traditional churches, people, and people were getting filled with the Holy Ghost and coming out and starting charismatic churches. Well, that's over. As a matter of fact, we probably have more people in the country now that are unsaved than we do saved. Okay? And uh, so hoping for a charismatic renewal, that's, don't, that's not what we need. We need the church that's already here to charge themselves up, to build themselves up. You don't need a renewal, a, a charismatic renewal of getting um, new people filled with the Holy Ghost. The people who have been filled with the Holy Ghost need to get refilled. They need to get charged up. They need to get built up. Amen. They need to be edified. They need to be strengthened. I mean, when we, we sing songs in the church, we shouldn't, have to, we shouldn't be going, Hallelujah. The Bible says, lift up the hands that hang down. Lift up the voice down still. Amen. Well, how are you going to, if you stay charged up, you want to lift your hands up when things, are, when things inspire you, when you hear uh, songs of, of faith and songs of inspiration, things that lift you up to the Lord. You're going to, you're going to want to bless the Lord. I'm going to have to teach them on worship soon. Um, you know, there's, there's seven Hebrew words for um, worship or praise, and uh, they all mean something different. But if we can just kind of get, just get into just, just doing one of them. <laughs> Amen. You know, and build on that. Um, hallelujah. But to edify. How many of you ever, ever tried to go crank a car with an uh, almost dead battery or a dead battery, just barely dead battery? 
Then a couple of weeks ago, Nathan was out here, and, and uh, he's sitting out in the front, par- front of the parking lot out there, and I think he went out there and sat out there and had his music on and the lights on in his car, and all the kids were running around, and then we got ready to leave, and he went, there's a little charge there. But it won't enough to start it. It won't enough to jump it over. Have you ever felt like that when you're walking with God? Yeah. There's a little bit there, but it ain't enough to push, push you over. Not enough to push you over to, to, to running and, and to going. Well, how are you going to get that? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue yeah. edifies, charges himself. Now, what we did, we didn't have any jumper cables at the church. <laughs> How do you come to church? And so somebody's supposed to be bringing some jumper cables. We'll have a set here all the time. All right. So Deneen called Marty. Marty drove up, got out, hooked up the jumper cables to the car, ran in about 30 seconds. What happened? It charged it. It edified the battery. That battery got enough charge to start. And a lot of us have gotten to the place where we're so drained we know what we're supposed to do. We even know what we want to do. There's not enough charge there to go do it. And if you'll take some time and commit to spending time praying in the Spirit every day, you'll charge yourself up and you'll find out your starter works better. You'll find out that when you say, I want to do something, and you, you turn the key of the I want to, it'll kick the engine over. Hallelujah. And you'll start running. Glory to God. Can you say amen? Well, how's that going to happen? You've got to make a decision. You've got to hook up to something and get charged. Now, see, the Holy Ghost is already there. All you got to do is cl- clip on the temper cables of tongues and pray that out and get charged up. And then when you say, now I want to, I want to be at church the half hour early and, and go to the prayer room and be ready for service. And here you come. Amen. I'm telling you, it'll change your life. Glory to God. Amen. Think about think about the day. How many remember when you first got saved and got filled with the Holy Ghost? You're praying all the time in tongues, and you're riding down the road praying in tongues. Man, you were church early, you were church late. I mean, you won't ever tired, you won't ever wore out, you won't ever drug. Uh, come on now. And you just thought it was the excitement of being. No, 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 no. You, this is what you were doing. You, the excitement, yeah, but you, you, were, you were feeding that excitement by staying charged all the time. Running the meetings, glory to God. I mean, if, if, if Faith and Victory Church wasn't having church and somebody else was having one, you ran over there and came back. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes you think church, if they walk in and throw a net over in hog time and say, until you decide you're staying here, you're not leaving. Well, that's, you know, we know that's not going to happen. Amen? Amen? So, so, the reason that it was so easy in there in those days was because you were staying charged. But if your alternator goes, starts going bad, what's, you know, how many of you know how your alternator works? It, it, it recharges the battery while you're driving. If your alternator ever goes bad, it'll kill your battery. Anybody ever had an alternator go out while you were driving? I had my Fiat Spider. I was when I was driving down the road, and the lights started getting dimmer and dimmer. I made it home, but the next day, I mean, I didn't get the. I got the click, <laughs> click. All right, charge the battery up, crank it. Alternator, you want to place alternator and got it cranked back up and you know going. You guys stay, you guys stay charged. So you, your life will be different if you will commit to once again. Go, I, something Pastor Huffman said this week, and, and we've we've said these things, but I, I'm, I'm the renewed emphasis. Go back to things we used to do. Now, I'm not talking about we got to go back and do everything the way every service exactly the way we used to do it. I'm talking about go back to the principles. The basic principles of what we used to do. Spending time in the Word. Spending time praying in the Holy Ghost. Being, I mean, you know, desiring things of the Spirit. You start coming to church charged up with desiring the things of the Spirit. And God will meet you at the front door. And you'll see manifestations and demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Isn't that right? 
Hallelujah. So we want to stay. And, and then, not only do you edify yourself that way, you can stay filled. Now, it's all a whole lot better to be fully charged all the time than to have to run out and put a set of jumper cables on every day. Yes. Isn't that right? Now, Nathan has a set in his trunk now. He's riding around with them because that battery went out one time. He, he went and found the jumper cables in the garage and put them in his car because he, he don't want to get caught somewhere when that happens again. <clears throat> it's just good. It's good to stay charged. Yes. And instead of draining it, so now what he did that night was he opened the door, turned on his music, and opened, let the light on, and there was nothing going on to recharge the battery. It was just draining it. Life will drain your battery. I said, life will drain your battery. And if you don't recharge it, it'll kill your battery. Hello? He cranked his car. The alternator would have kept the battery charged. And so in that case, the charger is the alternator. Praying in tongues will be your alternator. You keep, you keep yourself charged, and it'll just keep running right all the time. Now, thank God we can get jumps if, if, we, if we drain it down too much. But why keep running off having to find somebody that couldn't give you a jump? Yes. When you can stay charged. Yes. Stay full. Amen? So Ephesians 5.18 says what? Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. The Greek says be ye being filled. It's a consistent thing. Be ye being filled. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God in the name of the Father, uh, in the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, be ye being filled. Be ye being filled with the Spirit. Stay full. Stay charged. How are you going to do that? Consistently praying in other tongues. Now, see, the Word of God renews your mind. Praying in tongues edifies or charges your spirit. They work together in combination, the, the, the feeding on the Word and the praying in the Spirit are, are, part, are, are, are equally important parts of establishing and creating a consistent spiritual walk. And we talk a lot about renewing our minds to the Word. We talk about feeding on the Word. We talk about, you know, overcoming world conformity. But I'm going to tell you, praying in tongues is just as important. Now, not, not one without the other. Okay, but we're talking about praying in tongues right now. So that's why, so that's why the emphasis is on that. It's not, one, it's not one or the other. It's both in combination. But I'm telling you, be ye being filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, be not drunk with wine. We got churches now major more on the fact they can drink wine with dinner than they do about praying in the Spirit. Hello? What's that going to do? It's simply going to uh, uh, satisfy human cravings and pacify uh, carnal things in you where, where it, you know, because alcohol is, is really a depressant, but it also uh, alters your state. So you're, you're, you're altering your physical state. And we got churches promoting the altering of the physical state instead of promoting walking in the Spirit. By praying in other tongues and charging your spirit up. I'm going to tell you something. If you get enough of the Holy Ghost in you, you won't need any wine to fix your flesh. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. You won't need the wine. I'm going to tell you what, it'll get you to the point where you get so full. Of, you know, remember when Jesus was at the well and the Samaritan woman came to him and he ministered to her and the disciples showed up and they had gone to get food. They come back and, and uh, he wasn't hungry and they said, you know, did somebody else feed him? He said, he said no, my meat's to do the will of him that sent me. See, so when, when you get doing spiritual things, you're not, your flesh gets pacified. It, gets, it get, becomes a subordinate issue in your life, not the driving issue. It, it becomes where it starts going along for the ride instead of leading everything. And it wants to run everything. Your flesh wants to run everything. But praying in the Spirit keeps your spirit charged up. Amen. So you're to stay filled. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Oh, my. If we can get the church back to staying full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Staying full of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Woo, glory. Glory. 
Amen. You'll come to, I'll tell you something else will happen. Pastor Ed's sermons will get better. I'll take, I'll guarantee you, if, you, if you're full of the Holy Ghost, my sermons will be better. Why? Because you'll be hearing what the Spirit, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the church. And what will happen is, if you're full of the Holy Ghost, you'll be hearing what the Spirit's saying when I'm preaching. But if you're not full, you're not charged up, your carnal mind will take over and you'll hear what you want to hear. He's preaching right at me today. Somebody told him I was doing such and such, and he's preaching. I'll dare him call to do that publicly. I'll tell you, people get all kinds of crazy stuff. They get all kinds of wild ideas, start acting crazy. Why? Because they're not staying full. They're not, they're not being, they're not being uh, full of the new wine. But if you get, you'll get full of the Holy Ghost and stay full of the Holy Ghost, the sermons at the church will be better, the worship will be better. You'll be amazed how great worship was this week if you prayed the Holy Ghost all week. Yeah. You spend an hour praying in tongues Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Get up Sunday morning, at least get in 30 minutes so before you come to church. By the time you get to church, I mean, and they start singing, you'll be like, my God, uh, Nathan and Dick and, and, those, and, and, and whoever else is up there, they, they, something happened to them this week. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, something happened to you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. How many of you ever gone to church t just tired? Yeah. Dog tired. I've been in services where, you know, uh, and I'll admit it now, but I've been in services where I went and stood in line for hours to go hear Dad Hagen. By the time the service started, I was so tired I couldn't even, I mean, you couldn't hardly enjoy the service. It took the whole worship service, an hour and 20 minutes of that, and praying in tongues and everything during that to get charged back up so you could enjoy the service. But I'm going to tell you, when you first started out, you're like, oh, I'm so tired. I guess you should have just sat down, you know, thank God I don't have to do that anymore. Thank God I don't have to sit there for four and a half, five hours to get in and get a seat. Yeah, I mean, we should walk out the front door, go around and get back in line. So you get in for the 7 o'clock service. You have to stand in line six hours to get in and get a seat where you wanted a seat. You didn't want to be in some room somewhere on television. That's, you know. You, get, you can get physically tired to where you can't enjoy something. But I'll tell you what, if you, even when you're physically tired, if you'll and, and that's what would happen. You get to um, worship in the Lord and then start being there by yourself. To, oh, it's a shaprapo bushiko monday. And all of a sudden, strength, that charge starts to take place. And you start getting edified and built up. Amen? And next thing you know, you're all back into the groove. Yeah. Amen? Are you here? I mean, you're, 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 you're in the flow. Hallelujah. So, if we would spend more time attending to spiritual matters instead of trying to figure out how to do stuff in the natural, I'm going to be honest with you, you know, I don't understand why people are fighting to be able to drink when they can just go drink from God's well. When they can be drinking of the Holy Ghost. Oh, we are free to, we're free to drink wine. How many hours are you spend praying in tongues a day? Well, it relaxes me. I'll tell you what, you pray in tongues, you'll get relaxed. You can pray yourself in tongues right to sleep. Are y'all here? You're going home. Hallelujah. And you can bring the peace of God praying in tongues. Amen. So let's, let's, let's look at it. Just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to challenge you. Okay, this is Wednesday. All right, and I know we, I know we just had a four meeting, and, and, and I know in the past we, we've not had the Wednesday night service when we had a Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. I'm not going to do that anymore. And just, you know, we're going to have church, and who comes, who comes. Praise the Lord. Glad you guys came. All right, you know, because that, well, we had guest speaker, ain't nobody going to come out. Well, you guys came out, so we're, we're going to, uh, we've done that a few times. We're not going to do that anymore where we stop. We don't have the Wednesday night service afterwards because um, we all need to keep getting what we can get. Amen. But I'm going to challenge those of you here right now. To commit to pray an hour in tongues tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, and whatever you can get in on the way to church or whatever, however you get up early on Sunday morning before you get here. And commit to come early. Commit to be here 15 minutes early. This is what I'm talking about. We don't, we don't, we don't even try to half hour, hour. Just get here 15 minutes early. Commit tonight to do that. Commit to pray in tongues an hour each day and then whatever you can get in Sunday morning when you get up before you get over here driving over here, whatever it is, and then ask yourself after the service what the difference was, what, the, what it was like compared to what you thought it had been like. 
I guarantee you this much. It'll be different. Yes. If it's just for you, you'll be different. Because mm -hmm. you'll be in a different place. Mm -hmm. You will be in a different place. Amen. See, I've been in services where people who were just flat out carnal were sitting there listening and they weren't getting anything or they were getting something whacked out different. Yeah. And you're sitting there going, well, this is revelation. This is great. And then you, you, talk, to, you talk to them later and they're going, well, uh, I didn't like a thing that went on in there. There it is. And I'm thinking, what? We've had people sit in our church right here. And I've had them sit right out here in front of me. And one's crying and peeved with me. Because they don't like what I'm saying. And the people right beside them are getting blessed about to jump up and run around the church. Well, what's the difference? It's where you are. And see, if you'll pray in tongues, it'll get you where you need to be. It'll get you to a spiritual flow. Yeah. Yeah. I said it'll lead you in a spiritual walk. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Your communion with God, God will speak to your spirit. And, 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 and I'll be honest with you, I, I can tell you, in seasons and times where there's been, where I spent extra time in prayer and in the Holy Ghost. I mean, I've had some, some of the most phenomenal manifestations of the spirit. Um, that you could, you could fathom. A number of years ago, we were in our church and that we came out of. And um, I'd been on a six-week fast. Now, I don't recommend that to anybody. Now, it was a partial fast. I'd fast five days and eat two. I did that for six weeks. I mean, I started the month of February and went to the month of, middle of March like that. I'd, eat, I'd fast Monday through Friday, and I worked a job, too. I was working, I was working, I was working at the bar barbecue restaurant. <laughs> I'm looking at food all day, you know? Monday through Friday, and then I'd break fast on Saturday and Sunday, and then go back on it Monday. I did that for six weeks. Well, we were in church on the sixth week, and I've been spending more time praying in tongues. I'll tell you what, you, you get your flesh under and spend time praying in the Spirit, and you walk over to some things. And I'm, we're in the, we're in the, I'm on the front row of the church, and the pastor's up on the platform. And uh, <clears throat> I had a tongue of interpretation, and it was to him. And, and it wasn't rebuking, but it was, it was, it was directional. And, uh, and he answered back. When the Lord, he said something, Lord, how I, and, and all of a sudden, there I go. And we had, the, and this conversation starts going on where he's, at, he's asking God questions, and I'm answering them by the Holy Ghost. So you get over into the Spirit. You get praying in the Spirit, and you'll walk in things in the Spirit. Now, not just walk in the Spirit, but you'll walk in deeper dimensions of the Spirit. Now, you might be flaky. It wasn't flaky. I mean, he was a pastor. I was submitted to that. Um, he acknowledged its accuracy. I mean, it was, you know, uh, the congregation knew. They, they could sense the power of God in the whole building. And, it, and, and then in, in, in that same period of time, we were, all, we were ministering together. He was ministering, and, and, and he had me with him. And um, we were on the front steps. They had like six steps. They had a really tall platform. It was, it was a gymnasium we had bought. And so we were like five steps up to the platform because it was, you know, it was a gym that we converted into a church. And uh, we're on there, and we start talking in tongues back and forth. And it's almost like you were speaking English. You knew what you were saying. So you can, you can pray in the Spirit and, and get into the Spirit where you start walking, what do you say? And desire things of and pertaining to the Spirit yeah, yeah. or the Holy Ghost, spirituals. Desire spirituals. Desire to get into that place where you're, you're, you're walking in spiritual things. Not weird, not flakely, not out. You know, uh, oh, I, uh, I see that you are, you know, you are, you're the next Catherine Kuhlman. Oh, oh, uh, If there's an next Catherine Kuhlman, God will raise him up. Yeah. You can't. You know, or God showed me that you have three flat tires and one regular tire and, you know. Well, okay, so you went outside and looked at the car before church. I'm talking about walking in the Spirit and being in that realm where God can use you to bring light and life to people and help. Desiring things and other pertaining to the Holy Ghost. See, praying in tongues gets you over there. Word keeps you balanced. Here yeah, the Lord shows me your wife's going to leave you. You're going to marry another man. No. That would be really bad. We know God wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. We can judge that one right from the Word, can't we? 
First of all, you can't marry another man. I don't care if your wife does leave you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, the Lord, showed, the Lord has shown me that you, that so-and-so in the church is your next wife. Well, I'm married. Oh, no, but your, wife not gonna, your wife's not going to live much longer. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm not talking about that kind. I'm talking about walking in the Spirit by staying full. You know, it's easy, you can go a lot further when your battery's charged than you go when you, every time you turn the car, but you got to find somebody to help you jump, jump your cables. Yeah, yeah you more peace too. <laughs> Amen? Or your battery dying while you're riding down the road. You go, yeah, that's, that just don't work, does it? All right. So, so we're talking about communion with God, divine communication. We're talking about uh, spiritual edification. And we're talking about staying full. So we can, we can what? So we can desire spiritual things. Walk in love, but be desirous of spiritual things. We can be a blessing. Our church can be a blessing. Our church is called to be a blessing. There are things for us to do. Yes. Amen. Uh, there's a vision for us to walk in. And uh, praise the Lord. <laughs>